So yeah, thank you for, for having us. And hopefully, yeah, this is the, the first of these kind of seminars that we can share between the, the school and, and the centre. And I'm going to be talking to you um, about something which is um, quite far removed from some of the mainstream stuff that happens at, uh, at CORE. But probably what you'll see is a lot of the methods I apply here are applicable to, to a whole host of, uh, of applications. But what I'm focusing on particularly is a few pieces of research, a couple of years old now. Um, I'm in the middle of a project at the moment, so I didn't want to present that because I'm still not sure where that's going to head. So I thought, let's present stuff that I know is right um, and we can, can go from there and I'll, I'll whet your appetite. So next time I come, hopefully I'll have some full proper findings that I can give you. Um, so in the next um, 20 minutes or so, you're going to get a whistle-stop tour of, of what I do. Um, talk about why we want to monitor volcanoes, okay, and why we want to do this from afar. That's probably quite obvious, but um, it, it would be very useful if we could stand there and look, but it's not always possible. Um, talk to you about how we do this, or how I do this. There's a lot of different ways of doing it. Um, talk to you about how I do it, some of the results and some of the prospects that this holds for the um, for future. So the key reason why we monitor volcanoes is that we want to, the ideal situation is that we want to determine a baseline, a normal behaviour for a particular volcano. Okay, and if we can figure out what the volcano's normal behavior is, then we can, in theory, and assuming nothing changes, we can figure out what are deviations from that normal and therefore what the implications for that might mean. And the analogy I often give for this is um, doctors, okay? Medical doctors, not, not us academic type doctors, okay? So you go to hospital and the doctor measures your heart and it's a normal rhythm. Nothing to worry about here. We understand if this is your heart or if this is the behavior of a volcano, we understand that this is your normal activity. Nothing to worry about whatsoever. If you go to the doctor and they start seeing unusual activity, they start to get worried. Okay, and this is what would trigger an alert in my mind. The volcano is doing this normal stuff, and then suddenly things change. And that change might mean that it's becoming hotter, or it might mean that it's becoming colder. Either way, there's a change. There's something that we need to look at to investigate. So the volcano might look, um, become less active. The volcano's activity might become more sporadic. Or obviously, the big thing that we're looking for is death. OK, um, that doesn't generally happen at volcanoes, but you get the idea. There's a normal activity that we are trying to derive and any deviations from that are what needs to alert us. And to get this normal behavior, we need to have a lot of data, as much data as possible and going back in time. And deviations from that um, should set us on alert. And this was one of the first pieces of work a long, long time ago now, but this is one of the first pieces of work that was able to monitor volcanoes from afar. So we're talking the, the mid-1980s here. Okay? And effectively, what this is showing is heat. And this is a volcano in, in Chile. And what they found was that before eruptions, so each of those little arrows there, the heat given off by that volcano, and this is measured by satellite, would decrease. So the volcano is getting cooler and cooler and cooler, then bang. Cooler and cooler and cooler, bang. Cooler and cooler and cooler, bang. Okay. And this is the sort of work that kind of influenced my, my PhD many years ago. Um, not this long ago, but anyway. Um, <laughs> anyway, a while back. Um, and the theory was here, um, well, what, what the scientists found, what was going on, is that the volcano cooling down, and it kind of goes against what we would generally think. You'd think a volcano would get hotter and hotter and hotter before it erupts. But no, what's going on in this situation is that the volcano itself is collapsing on itself. So it's appearing cooler. All of the cracks in the top of the volcano through which heat and gases will come out, they were closing as the volcano was collapsing in on itself. Those cracks are what would allow the volcano to release its pressure. So the volcano is getting cooler and cooler, collapsing on itself. Cracks and gaps are closing up until suddenly the gases reach kind of a threshold value and there's an eruption. So for the first time, scientists could see that actually volcanoes seem to get less active before they get more active. And that's one of the, the key things that we, we try and find out in the work that I'm doing. Why do you want to do this from afar? Well, as I say, it's kind of self-explanatory, really. Volcanoes are dangerous places. Okay? Um, this is an eruption of a volcano here in Guatemala. You do not want to be there. Okay? But unfortunately, without being there, you can't get the data that you need a lot of the time. But these are hazardous environments, as I'm sure you're all aware. They're toxic and um, corrosive and, and the like. 
We've got our various hazards, the lava's hot, you've got bits of lava flying everywhere, sometimes long distances, the gases are toxic, uh, the pyroclastic flows, well, these are what, what kill people. And this is a really tragic picture here. In 1993, these scientists were on their way up the top of Galeras. The next day, these scientists with the cross next to them were not alive. They were caught in an eruption of that volcano. Okay? And this, I would imagine, is probably one of the key stimuli um, that led to the remote monitoring of volcanoes, or that said we need to do this from afar. Because if we're losing these, these very clever people, these people that know about the activity of the volcano, how can we expect to, to learn any more about them? So monitoring volcanoes from afar is obviously much safer, and I'm much happier doing that. Though field work's obviously wonderful too. So how do I do that? I look at the heat, okay? Anybody got any idea how hot the filament is of a light bulb? Yeah, about a thousand, roughly, okay? About a thousand degrees, it's staggering, but it's really, really hot, okay? By being at that temperature, it glows, okay? Things need to be very, very hot to glow. Like lava, how hot's lava? Anybody want to have a go, have a guess? Less than the cover, but similar to a light bulb, it's about a thousand degrees, give or take. It's hot enough to glow. Here we have some um, steam, basically, some steam, a plume being given off uh, from a volcano here, probably about 200 degrees. Okay, I didn't go in and measure it myself, um, but you can't see the heat associated with this. Okay, you can only do that with a thermal camera. The sorts that you see on crime programs with a criminal running away and you can track them down. And like. So by focusing a thermal camera onto the um, gas plume, we can actually start to see how hot it is. Okay, or see that there's heat associated with it. The same for these rocks. Looking at these rocks, you might think, oh, they're fine. But when you touch them, they're actually hot. And we can use a thermal camera to measure that. But these situations rely on you being on the ground and having a thermal camera to look at that volcano. Fortunately, there are these same thermal cameras on a number of satellites orbiting above the Earth. My research so far, until fairly recently, has focused on NASA satellites. That's just because they were further ahead. The European Space Agency has launched a few really good satellites in the last few years, and I'm getting more uh, involved in those. But because these satellites have thermal cameras on them, they can look down and look at the heat from that volcano. We can tell how hot it is through time. And some of these sensors, Terra, for example, that's been functioning since 2001. So we have nearly 20 years' worth of data. We can start to determine a baseline activity of all volcanoes on the planet. And just for an example here, these are the craters at Etna, Mount Etna. Okay? There are four craters. Three are generally active at any time. And you can clearly see the, the craters here. Okay? This is our satellite looking down. This is what a thermal image of an active volcano looks like. Same volcano, different eruptive event. This is Mount Etna during a, uh, a fairly recent uh, eruption event. You can see the hot lava, okay? You can see the plume. It's darker because it's slightly cooler because it's risen up in the atmosphere and it also has ash in there as well, so it's absorbing uh, lots of radiation. This is all well and good. We get a nice image of the volcano and this is spectacular and great to show to students in a lecture and they got all excited about how dangerous it might be and da da da, -da. Um, but the utility from this that I see is the numbers that we can extract from it. We can get rid of all of that background. We don't need the background. We are just interested in the heat from that lava. And as I'm sure you're all aware, this is just like a digital photograph. Each of the pixels in our photograph has a value associated with it. So we can start to draw lines across our volcano. We can start to work out how hot, well, how much radiation we're detecting. And we can turn that value of radiation into energy. We can basically quantify how much heat, in terms of energy, the volcano is giving off at any time. Now, this seems like a manually intensive process. With some programming, you can get it to do this in a couple of days for every volcano on the planet. Sounds easy, it's not. But once you've got that data, it's, it's ready to roll, and it isn't as manually intensive as it looks here. The main problem, however, is cloud. Okay, we can't see through cloud, uh, not when we're using thermal imagery. And this is the, the first piece of work I wanted to, to present just to show you the issues um, associated here. Um, our red, this is uh, all of the volcanoes in Indonesia. 
okay? And our red and blue dots, hopefully they're clear, are where we have, where volcanic activity has been detected by a satellite, okay? Our green dots are where activity has been reported. And you'll see there are very large periods of time where volcanoes have been active, but we haven't been able to see what's going on. Okay, and this is Indonesia, it's constantly cloudy and stormy and the like. There are situations though where um, satellites see things, but humans haven't, perhaps because that volcano is so remote or the equipment is down or something. So there are pros and cons to, to this approach, but you can see how using reports on the ground plus our satellite imagery, um, we can get a, a rough idea of what's going on at our volcano. I just wanted to show you um, how a volcano might look in the absence of cloud. Beautiful. This is a, a, a volcano in Inyordenesia. Don't know where that is. Anyway, you get, you get the idea. Um, this is how the, the volcano kind of would look um, in, our, in our satellite imagery. But we've always got cloud. We've always got a plume. So this plume here is covering up a lot of the heat that we would otherwise have. So cloud and volcanic plumes are, are always an issue. We just have to deal with that. Another issue, this was my most exciting piece of field work. Um, it all went wrong, as you'll see. Um, got some money to fly a helicopter over the lava flows of Kilauea in Hawaii. An amazing time, okay? This was the route the helicopter took. We'd timed it to the minute that the satellite was gonna fly over, 705 kilometers up. On that day, it was cloudy. So I still had a great trip to Hawaii, but I had, what, four data points to play with? Um, nothing you can do. It goes over every 16 days. Unfortunately, I couldn't get money to go back 16 days later. I had to deal with this, uh, and that's some of the stuff that I'm currently working on. So satellite imagery is not great for instantaneous imagery because you can't tell where the cloud's there. But over 20 years, you do get a good idea of what's going on at that volcano. And that brings me to, to some of the results for, from some of the work. Um, I did this with some colleagues in, in Hawaii and another lecturer over in, uh, in the school, Charlie Hill Butler. Um, what we have here is basically a summing of all of the power given off from all of the volcanoes on the planet, all of the active volcanoes on the planet from 2000 to 2014. It's a logarithmic scale there. And to uh, 95 volcanoes were looked at. And to give you an idea of the amount of power that's associated with these things, this is the amount of power um, released from the, the nuclear bomb at Hiroshima. Okay, so many volcanoes release many more times energy than that through the period. One megaton nuclear, these are, yeah, it's, there aren't many big energy sources, so we kind of have to talk like this. But um, Kilauea, gave off enough energy in this time period to power the United States for 82 days. So that's another story. I'm not talking about how we could harness that power, but there is a lot of power given off from these things, just to put it into perspective. The key thing that we pulled out from this was that we could start to classify our volcanoes based on the amount of energy that they were giving off. I don't know how your geology is in, in the audience, but there are different types of lava. Okay, and therefore different types of volcanoes. And what we found was that our non-explosive volcanoes are volcanoes that are constantly erupting, but not particularly dangerous. They were all up the upper end. Okay, they were giving off most energy because they're constantly erupting lava, but um, it, it's constant, it's not periodic events. The sorts we see in Hawaii our felsic volcanoes, these are slightly more dangerous volcanoes because the magma and the lava is slightly thicker. It often causes more explosive eruptions. These volcanoes um, were in the center area, so our blue colored lines here. So we could see that these volcanoes that are roughly dangerous periodically um, are not emitting so much energy, but we can actually um, get an understanding of what it is that they're doing through time. And our final most dangerous volcanoes are the volcanoes that hardly emit any energy. That's because in this whole period, they probably erupted once. In that time, they may have killed tens or hundreds of people, okay, but they don't emit much energy. So by taking the time series from, from a period of time, we can start to classify volcanoes as to whether they're likely to be uh, dangerous or not. This Lascar, a very explosive volcano, which is way at the, the end spectrum here. 
And NASA actually picked up some of this work. We're trying to, so we're kind of working to, to see how we can use this in future. Siri, sorry. <laughs> it, it never works when I want it to. And now I don't want it to, it's asking me the question. Sorry about that. We're nearly at the end there, but gave you a little laugh to come back to. Um, so we can take this here is uh, various other volcanoes for, from these different time periods, looking at certain volcanoes um, during an eruptive event. So radiant flux, basically heat, and what happened to that volcano through time during these eruptive events. This is the sort of stuff we could do on an individual volcano basis. Um, but that's all well and good. We can see patterns. But we wanted to chuck some statistics at it to see, are there periodicities in this volcanic behavior? Is, so the normal behavior is this. Are there regularities in that data? So what we did, we applied some uh, wavelets to the data. Okay? It's a, a, a statistical technique which tries to extract patterns from data. And it produces these weird and wonderful graphs, which um, aren't as complicated as they look at all. Um, what it shows here, so this is Mount Etna from 2000 to 2014. This is the heat, so various eruptions of the volcano through time. Chuck it into our wavelets, so using programming, it produces this, this beautiful diagram here. And it shows the periodicity of events. And what it's showing here is that between 2003-ish to 2009, there was a period, this is in years, Oh, what's that? About one and a half years. So you can kind of see that on the top line here as well. Every one, or one and a half or so years, the volcano was erupting. But then the activity changed. Something changed here. And it might alert us to a change in the, the volcanic activity. Earlier on in this period, there's a periodicity of, what's that? Probably um, a couple of months. Okay? The volcano was erupting on and off for a couple of months. But again, that activity stopped. Other volcanoes aren't so clear in what they show. Narragongo in Africa, Tyrol in Africa. Um, these volcanoes don't show any periodicity. There's a ramping up of behavior. There's odd behavior, but no periodicity. Nothing we can use to determine a normal behavior of these volcanoes. And this is what I find most impressive. These are all volcanoes. So all volcanoes on the planet from 2000 to 2014 looking for periodicity. Nothing happened apart from here. 2005, what happened then? Killed 200 or so thousand people. Tsunami. A mass earthquake, magnitude 8.9, caused another volcanoes to go off. Okay? And that is reflected in this signal through time. And scientists are still working out the implications of that. That mass um, earthquake on the Pacific Rim there stimulated a load of volcanoes a couple of weeks later. And there was a periodicity that occurred. Only lasted for about six months, but it stimulated um, global uh, volcanic activity, or particularly down in, in that area. So what does this mean for the future? Am I saying that once we've got a periodicity for all volcanoes, we'll be able to predict them? Possibly, one day. Okay? The problem is the science is pretty young. Back in the 60s, when people were peace and loving and, and, and the like, um, Plate tectonics was still fairly controversial. It's a new science. We've been trying to predict the weather for thousands of years, and we still don't know whether it's going to rain. I looked out the window this morning, like, do I need a coat? Do I need an umbrella? Do I need, what, what do I do? If we still can't predict the weather, and we've been trying to for thousands of years, how can we do it for volcanoes when we've only known how they behave for about the last 60? Um, however, we're getting better, OK? The problem is that we're not good enough. This was the case study I used. Um, I use it every year since, since this happened. Japan is the most well-monitored country on the planet when it comes to volcanic activity. Back in 2014, on target, erupted with no um, precursory behavior whatsoever. People were hiking on it. People were having fun on the volcano. And it suddenly just erupted. No warning whatsoever. So we're getting better at these things. But I think there's still um, a long way to go. That's me. <laughs>